Lord, you're never going to let me down. I can remember a time in my life when I felt the Lord had dropped the ball of my life and left it shattered on the floor. I chose this song. This is a difficult song for me to sing at times. And those pieces are on the floor. God is the floor upon which those broken pieces rest. God is the, God is the floor upon which my life has been spilled out. And he collects it, and he gathers it, and he reforms it, and he fills it with himself. We are all broken vessels waiting to be filled with the fullness and the presence and the goodness of God. And now for my message. Happy 4th of July. Some think of it as America's birthday, but for those who birthed it, it was more like the beginning of labor that was going to last years. Not knowing if you would survive the childbirth of this nation, the coming wars, the years of war, the years of deprivation, disease, cold, desertion, lack of funds, fighting the greatest military power the world had known up to that point. And if they managed to survive it, what would become of the great experiment of the government of we the people, for the people, by the people? Now that they are finally free from a corrupt monarchy, would they find the secret sauce to form a union that could hold together before it fragmented into a thousand different pieces of self-interest, each seeking to leverage the power of the union for their own good over that of the common good. These words of the Declaration of Independence have been written deeply into the American psyche. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. These words have morphed over time to, a form the 20, to form 21st century souls that we have a divine right to be empowered to do, the divine right to be given, and the divine right to become the things we believe will make us happy. If we are not happy, then there must be some despot, some tyrant, keeping it from us. As a free people, it is our, our right, nay, our duty, to unfollow, unfriend, demonize, and throw off any opinion, government, employer, cultural norms, religion, family, spouses, or any other duty in conflict with the prime directive to pursue our own happiness at all cost. Pursuing our happiness has become our highest virtue, the secret sauce holding us together. And those who promise to give it to us, well, that's what keeps them in power and us in bondage. As common to all humanity since Adam, we have fallen prey to the unconscious programs for happiness of the false self to fill our need for safety and security, for power and control, for esteem and affection. To secure our future happiness against all threats, foreign and domestics, our false selves form alliances with the false selves of others, resulting in, resulting in systemic Injustice as one group competes with another for a greater piece of the ingredients to fill their happiness pie. Well, the false self is not evil. It's just an empty vessel. An empty vessel looking to fill the soul's desire for divine love and happiness with every good gift from God. But it's unable to know God himself. It is coping and doing the best that it can with what it has. No, the false self is not evil, but much evil comes from it when it tries to fill the soul's desire for spiritual growth with lesser good. How does one know what is good for pursuing happiness? This discernment is by no means infallible. It is formed, tested, and reformed over lifetimes. Yes, lifetimes, passed on from generation to generation. What tunes my heart to know my own truth and my internal compass is a complex merging of experience, reason, feelings, opinions of my family of origin, opinions of my culture, religious instruction, educational biases, social media, advertising, and spiritual encounter. The self-made soul is a unicorn 
It's a myth, an illusion, does not exist. Ironically, after thousands of years of Jewish wisdom literature, which everything is available here in our pocket, the sum knowledge, the sum total of human knowledge, is there for looking up. The Law and the Prophets, ancient philosophers, Jesus, the Living Word, the teaching of the apostles of the way of Jesus, 2,000 years of Christianity, the Enlightenment, the Reformation, the Great American Experiment, modern psychology, and wave upon wave of spiritual outpouring. After all of this, today we have lost our way of pursuing happiness. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle says there are two forms of happiness. The first is hedonic happiness, which is derived from pleasure, from doing what feels good. The second form is, is called eudaimonia, the type of happiness from seeking virtue and meaning. This is a sense of well-being that comes from a life that has meaning, value, and purpose, fulfilling responsibilities, investing in long-term goals, concern for the welfare of other people, living up to one's personal ideals. This is developing the inner life. This developing the inner life is the wisdom that has been passed on from centuries, from ancient times up to modern times. It is what captured the, the hearts and minds of those looking to be free from tyranny, did the freedom to pursue and develop that inner life and to work that out into your daily life. When they said the pursuit of happiness, that is what they had in mind. Well, we did not lose the way to pursue happiness because we're stupid. It was part of a well-funded campaign waged against us while we were still in diaper watching cartoons and being subject to all those advertisements for what we needed to finally be happy. In 2019, the U.S. advertisers spent $239 billion trying to convince Americans to buy the products that would make them happy, whether it was the right shampoo, the right car, the right clothing, pills, phones, vacations, audience, um, political candidates. Happiness comes from pleasure, and if you can purchase enough pleasure hits, you will become happy, a happy person. You don't need an inner life, you just need to upgrade your stuff to the latest and greatest. You need more and more and better and better. So in the hedonic happiness of where we've gravitated to today, we sort of have this formula. If I have pleasure one plus pleasure two plus pleasure three, so on and so on and so on, so on to pleasure infinity and beyond, I will finally be happy. And they want to sell us what their pieces of our pleasure. And that's the system we get locked into. Never mind the internal happiness. If you are internally happy, you just might learn to be content with what you have and stop buying. So don't look at column B, eudaimonia, a life of virtue, meaning, value, and purpose. That happiness is a fruit, not an object that you acquire. Happiness is a fruit coming out from the inside of you. Well, what I'm, hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that external stuff does not matter or is not important. It does not take much time in a third world country which you come to appreciate what it's like to have clean water, reliable electricity, good roads, transportation, food, an abundance of food, opportunities for education and medical care, and a level of freedom unheard of in human history. To have a government that is actually watching out for your safety and not hauling you off to prison in the middle of the night. These are great blessings in that first column, and we should receive them with gratitude. I'd rather have a phone that is sharp and fast and has a clear screen. I'd rather have fresh ground, organic free trade coffee than drinking freeze-dried Folgers in my cup. I'm extremely grateful for the health to enjoy hiking and a reliable car to get me there, to get me to here to church this morning. I'm grateful for these things. I experience pleasure in them. These are genuinely good things, but recognize that when it comes to the deep-seated, lasting contentment that permeates throughout your soul, 
These hedonic good pleasures are secondary to internal, intrinsic happiness. The secret of turning external pleasures into internal happiness is to slow down, to slow down and enjoy the simple pleasures of life and express gratitude for them, to free the heart from expecting the momentary pleasurable experiences, to free the heart from expecting that those momentary pleasures can fill what only God can fill. So we tune the heart to experience the pleasure of God. When we express gratitude, we tune our hearts to the goodness of God and the goodness of God in others. Happiness is the fruit of gratitude. If you would would pursue happiness, regularly practice gratitude. Say thank you to others and to the Lord throughout the day. Be aware of the gifts of goodness, truth, love, and beauty as you experience them throughout the day. So take a few moments as they are happening and experience them in depth. Slow down, savor them, breathe them in deeply, and let them wash over you. They cannot fill your soul, but they sprinkle blessing upon it. So right now we're gonna practice a gratitude exercise. I'm just gonna invite you to relax in your chair. Whenever we come to the Lord, it's from a place of rest. He's always inviting us into Sabbath rest, so we put our body in a place of rest. So just relax comfortably in your chair. I would invite you to close your eyes or just soften your gaze. And I want you to just pick a moment when you experienced a pleasure, a a bodily pleasure, a sensation. Maybe it was a good cup of coffee. Maybe it was driving your car. Maybe it was the air conditioning. (laughs) Maybe it was a cool breeze that you experienced last night sitting under the stars. Picture that moment and relive it. What were you sensing? Where were you sensing it in your body? Was it a taste? Were you hearing something? Let the enjoyment refresh within your soul. Now ask the Lord, Lord, where were you in that pleasure? Perhaps hiding in the background somewhere. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Father. Lord, where were you in it? Now thank the Lord. Express your gratitude to him for that good gift, the ability to enjoy it, his presence in it. How does the Lord respond to your gratitude? Amen. The secret of happiness is tuning the heart to God's goodness by practicing gratitude. As we grow in life, as we grow in the Lord, as we develop in human maturity and spiritual maturity, we go through stages of learning to love and we go through stages of how we experience happiness. For happiness and love are fully intertwined. We begin to align our, in the beginning stages of pursuing happiness, we begin to align ourselves with the way the Creator designed things to work, the way they're designed to flourish. To say it loosely, in a sense, God helps those who help themselves. This is self interest pursued with wisdom. We forsake the harmful activities of life to pursue the good. We progress to prune off the lesser good to pursue the greater good. We express gratitude for all things. Our capacity to be happy, to experience blessedness, grows as a fruit of this labor. That's a beginning stage. It's a good place to start. It's a good place to start training our children and ourselves. In the next stage of happiness, we'll move further into the eudaimonic, the intrinsic happiness of the soul. We pursue virtue, meaning, and purpose. 
Life and happiness flourish. Gratitude is the hallmark for a doing life for God kind of life. And if we continue to grow in union with God and others, it is only a matter of time before the wheels fall off. They have to. The wheels have to fall off. At some point, we need to learn to fly. At some point, we learn to long for the giver of the good gifts more than the gifts themselves. Up to this point, we have pursued God in order to receive. As God tuned your heart to deliver you from the tyranny of a life trapped in destructiveness, death, and futility, then God tuned your heart to receive gifts that give external happiness. But God continues to work within us. He then tunes our heart to, re to receive esteem from others and to grow in virtue. And then pride takes over <laughs> and the wheels fall off. We start comparing ourselves to others. Oh, I'm doing this more excellent than my wife. I am doing this more excellent than Peter. Or I suck at this compared to Peter, and I suck at being serving others the way Kathy serves them. So pride in comparison, I mean, I'm either exalting myself or I'm just debasing myself. But God has us to pursue a more excellent way to put aside comparison, to put aside competition, and to pursue the good for the good's sake, to pursue God for God's sake, to pursue love for love's sake, not in order to get, we pursue Jesus for Jesus' sake, not to get something greater than Jesus. If I pursue God, if I pray to God, then he will give me the good stuff that I need that will finally make me happy. No, we become to have a heart that's transformed in the very likeness of Christ, and we pursue God for communion with God. God has tuned our hearts to desire his spiritual consolation more than the praise of men. And again, at some point, the good feelings you experience from God, well, they're no longer enough. Your heart has grown to desire more than the good feelings God gives. Your soul becomes tuned to desire the divine communion to know the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, not as a theological concept of the Trinity, but to live and move and have your being in the living flow of divine love through which all of creation lives and moves and has its being. God is tuning your soul, your heart, your very all for ever deeper, broader, higher levels of union. God is tuning your soul to forever work out your salvation your new creation in Christ Jesus, your life in him, with him, and through him by his spirit. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul writes, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Pursuing, pursuing human happiness in all its earthly wonder and beauty is no longer enough. The life, of the, Spirit in, uh, the life of the Spirit of Christ in you has lit a hunger for the infinite beauty and happiness of the divine communion, the happiness Jesus experiences in the Father by the Spirit and invites us to join him in his life, his communion, his worship. In Revelation 2.17, we read these words. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and a new name written on the stone which no one knows except the one who receives it. One of the greatest sources of intrinsic happiness is becoming your new name, your true self that is hidden in the seed of Christ in you, as it begins to take root, transforming your inner being to be like his. No one else knows that name except the Lord and the one to whom the Lord reveals it. No one else, no matter how great their gift of prophecy, can reveal it to you. It is uniquely your name for fulfilled and perfected in Christ's union with you and revealed to you by him. In the book Unspoken Sermons, George MacDonald says this, 
The new, the new name is the communication of what God thinks of the person to that person. It is the divine judgment, the solemn holy doom of the righteous man, the come thou blessed, spoken to the individual. The true name, says McDonald, is the one that expresses the character, the nature, the meaning of the person who bears it. It's a person's own symbol in a word, the sign which belongs to them and no one else. Who can give a person this, her own name? God alone. For no one sees what a person is, and even seeing that person could express in a name word the sum harmony of what has been seen. God foresees it, he sees it, and he names it in you. And he waits for the day when you are ready to receive that name. To whom is the name given? The one that overcomes. When is it given? When one has overcome. Why does the Lord wait till one overcomes? Is he waiting to see what you will become? No, he sees it far in advance, but you are not ready to hear it. Just as repentance comes because God pardons, Yet a person becomes aware of the pardon only in the act of repentance. So too, it is only after a person has become become their name that God gives them the stone with the name upon it. For they are then ready to understand what the name signifies. Such a name cannot be given until the person becomes the name. God has been holding our names in his heart for all eternity. But until our hearts are formed into the likeness of Christ, until they are tuned to his name, we cannot hear it. The music of our own creation falls on our deaf ears, but the spirit within us hears. Slowly, gradually, the spirit reveals hints hints and glimpses of the true name, tuning our heart to hear it, calling us deeper into Christ transforming us into his image, preparing us to receive the name. We see this intercession in Romans 8, in verses 18 to 23. Paul tells us we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit is interceding with us according to the will of God. It is God's will, perfectly free, almighty will, that we become our true selves. Yet the nature of love is freely given and freely received. Love cannot be forced, nor becoming beings of love can be forced upon us. And yet the love of Christ, within us by the Holy Spirit, stirs up the love of God in our hearts, a consuming fire that that redeems, refines, and transforms our spirit, souls, and finally our bodies from the inside out. We are redeemed through and through, spirit, soul, and body, a vessel fully tuned to be filled with the fullness of God. All creation waits with bated breath for the revealing of your true self as a son and daughter of God, groaning as in childbirth, and we too groan in travail, the birth of who we truly are in Christ. In March 2012, six months after Kathy and I were married, I was told I had cancer. Either stage two sarcoma or stage four metastasis throughout my torso between my lungs and my pelvic floor. It was in too many places to operate. It would be two weeks before I knew which one. I wasn't sure what a sarcoma and a metastasis did, but the doctor told me, pray for sarcoma. I thought I had gallstones. I wanted to go back and choose door number one. My first reaction was, God, you can't do this to Kathy. She's already lost a husband. She's been widowed. This isn't fair to her. He says, John, I got Kathy. I love her more than you ever will or can. I have her. My second reaction was now. (laughs) 
after a lifetime frustrated wanting to be in ministry but having ministry fall apart through lack of funding and then deciding to get with the program, go to seminary, get my Master of Divinity while working full time, going through seminary seven years in the evening. It's like, I have one year, eight credits left. You're going to pull the rug now? I thought, I, I need to write something that will outlive me to make all this hard work pay off. And the Lord said, John, you came to seminary because you had wanted to repent for not loving me with your mind. This was loving me with your mind. You are a worshiper. When you walk, you sing, you worship. When you're cleaning the garage, you try to enter into that place of worship. When you're doing the dishes, worship. There doesn't need to be any payoff greater than the worship. It is enough. It is enough. Well, the Lord had Kathy in his care. that whether I lived or died, all would be well. I had other friends at the same time, one through going through cancer, one through ALS. They both perished, and yet with them, all is well. All will be well. The Lord's presence, his work in us, is enough. We are called to enter into his worship. Well, I am now well in body and soul and flourishing. But it's easy to forget, John, worship is enough. Peter keeps reminding as I'm working on my sermons, John, let it be worship for you. I pray that it will be worship for you to join in and hear what the Lord is doing, to wrestle with him through this and enjoy the process. So my question is, what glimpses of your new name, your true self, have you received? Whether it was a large life-changing moment facing your own mortality, or maybe just simply sitting in traffic and suddenly finding a new patience rising within yourself. I want you to think back and relive a moment when you felt the Lord's pleasure in seeing fruit, his fruit arise in you. Perhaps a moment when you were a vessel of love, of joy, of peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forbearance, faithfulness. What is a virtue that, it, or a purpose, perhaps a meaning in life that has taken root and borne fruit in your soul? Perhaps you found joy in fixing a meal for a sick, sick friend. In the middle of a very hectic week, you carved out the time to do so and you felt the Lord's joy, or working in the garden and causing things to grow, or creating a place of warmth and hospitality for people to gather. How has a, a virtue or a fruit of the Spirit or a purpose, a good purpose, given you a sense of goodness and happiness and well-meaning? So without comparing yourself to anyone else, whether it was better than or lesser than. Just simply pick a moment when experiencing a simple joy of joining in what the Father was doing with you, in you, and through you by the Spirit. And perhaps you weren't even aware at the time that it was God moving in with and through you, but upon reflection, as you ask God, where were you in this? You see the Father in the action. I want you to relive that, experiencing the feeling of the Father's pleasure as his beloved son or daughter. Attune your heart to how the Spirit within you rejoice to carry you into the awareness of the love of God and to share in what the Father was doing. Feel the Father's joy. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. So again, we're going to do a gratitude exercise. Just invite you to be comfortable in a place of rest. Maybe just scan your body, beating in from your feet up through your legs, your torso, your neck, your jaw, your eyes, your head, or the other way, it matters not. And where there is tension, just say, I see you. Come, Lord Jesus, into this tension.
Maybe notice your breathing. Noticing our breathing, not to control it, but just helps us to enter into a parasympathetic, parasympathetic state of rest, to slow down, to slow down and become aware of what the Spirit has been saying in the background, uh, perhaps unnoticed, unheard, but when we slow down, we go, oh, I see you, Lord. I hear you. So, Lord, I ask that you would bring a moment to each of those here when they've experienced a virtue, a purpose, a meaning that has been working out from their spirit into their souls and out into their bodies and into the world. Whether it was an act of love, of patience, of creativity, of sacrifice, a word spoken or a word graciously received, a kindness given, Lord, would you help us just to enter into the goodness of that once again without comparison, without grading it, simply enough to be doing it with you, in you, and through you. Where were you in it, Lord? Show us. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us in, into what you're doing, into who you are. Listen for the Lord's response. My child, it is my joy to do life with you. Little seed, fret not, you will survive. I hold you within my own life. You will not be shaken nor destroyed. I will cause you to root and grow you into, full, into the, your full stature in Christ by the Spirit with you, in you, sharing in and knowing, and knowing firsthand Jesus' eternal life with the Father. Henry Nouwen says, do not expect from man what only God can give. Because that's a sure way to set all relationships up for failure and disappointment. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, can never, get, can never fill that deep place of happiness that only God can fill. We must pursue a life that yields to the Spirit's daily, to the Spirit's daily retuning our hearts that we might be filled with the fullness of Christ and share in the fullness of his joy with the Father. John 17, during Jesus' high priestly prayer, records this. These words of Jesus. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. The true name Jesus manifested, the living word, God is salvation the good shepherd, the true vine, living water, the true bread that comes down from heaven, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, eternal life. All these are true manifestations of the Father's name, of the Father's being. So too is your true name. It is true of you, and it is true of God. For your being, your name flows from his being, from his name. To know Christ 
is to know your true self. To know your true self is to know Christ. So who are you? A wondrous child of God that all creation is waiting to be revealed. I invite you to tune your heart to come to the table of a Sabbath rest and to dine with him. Tune your heart to feel his compassion, his welcome. Within you, he sees the mighty tree that you will become. And yet he does not name you oak tree, for all you would see is what you are not. I'm but a little nutty acorn. So he says, come dear acorn, come and be blessed. Come and rest in me. Let my seed within your seed take root and transform you from within. Let Jesus reveal the name of the Father. Come and dine with him daily. Let him tune your heart and catch a glimpse of your true name. Come to the table. As Jesus took the bread, his body, and broke it and gave it to us. Take of Jesus and eat. And tune your heart to his life, his passion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his glorious rule and reign to make all things new. Jesus' body was broken for us, the living bread of heaven. He freely gives it. We don't have to sneak in and steal it. We don't have to beg for it. He offers it freely. He offers it continually. Likewise, the cup of the new covenant, of his love, of his life, of new life in him, of sharing his divine life with us, becoming human so that in being human we could become like him. His blood flows in us, recreating us from the inside, sharing his divine life, transforming our human life. Be still and know that I am God. Enter into his rest In this moment, as we come to the table, practice saying in every moment, yes, Lord, let it be done in me according to your will, according to your goodness, according to your love. So Lord Jesus, with you, we break this bread, your body. We drink this cup, the cup of salvation. Jesus, Lord of my soul, tune my heart to hear your voice. Tune my heart to know your name. Tune my heart to share with you in your death and resurrection and life. In your ascension and the coming kingdom and all its fullness, new creation. Tune my heart to abide in you, to overcome, to prepare me to receive my new name my true name. In Jesus' name, come to the table. So Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing to us the true name, the true character, the true goodness of the Father. Lord, that all you do flows from your love. Even your justice flows from your love. For you know that we are empty. Lord, in your justice, cries out to fill us with your presence, with your love, with your purpose, to transform us into the image of Jesus for which our hearts long, for which all creation longs. So in Jesus' name, receive the name of the Father, receive the name of the Son, and receive the name of the Spirit, that you might know your true self, 
receiving it daily with gratitude. And finally, to receive your true name that only Jesus knows and is so desirous to reveal to you for you to become what he has always dreamed for you to become. In Jesus' name, receive the gospel. Amen.